Well, yesterday afternoon, uh, we decided as a family, and by we, I mean my wife and I, decided that our family, my wife and I, and our kids would all uh, clean our boys' bedroom closet. Now, this is always a dangerous task because you have no idea what you're going to find in there. That's why we only do it about once a year. Thankfully, our kids are relatively clean, so we've never found a dead animal. We've never found, I mean, they're 10 and 11. I mean, we've never found any alcohol or cigarettes or anything else like that, so we're grateful for that. It's usually just a bunch of junk that we find. It's just messy. And you know what happens when you start dumping out all of the bins? You, you start to, to find pieces of broken toys and, and board games with half of the pieces missing. We found notes, some funny, some not so funny. We found loose baseball cards and action figures that we thought we were certain we got rid of years ago. And there is a thing every single time, without fail, there's never been a time that this didn't happen. We find the same thing every time. One single puzzle piece. Somehow it keeps, magically maybe, I don't know, it keeps coming back over and over again and we have no idea where it happens. Now I've been thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12 all week up until this day. And, and so as I looked down at this lone piece to a long lost puzzle, I thought about us. I thought about the local church. So when you open a, a, a brand new box, not one that's found in my boy's closet, but when you open up a brand new puzzle box and you dump all the pieces on the table, you'll see something, that every piece is unique. There may be some pieces that, that look similar or maybe are even almost identical. Uh, and even if they are identical, when you flip them over and you see the picture, the pictures are different. That every piece is unique. And each piece serves a bigger purpose than just itself. As I stared down at this lone puzzle piece on the floor, I started to think, by itself, that Peace can't really do a whole lot. I can look at it. I can put it up on a shelf. <clears throat> I can keep it in my wallet. I can take a picture of it. I have no idea what puzzle that comes from. I don't know what the bigger picture that piece was pointing me towards. And in a twisted sense, I, I imagine if Toy Story were real, it'd be pretty cool, but if Toy Story were real, that little puzzle piece would probably sound like an even more depressed Eeyore. I'm so lonely. Because a puzzle piece was not designed to be by itself. It was designed to fit into a bigger whole, something that was bigger and better than just it by itself, something that could accomplish wonderful things. A couple hours of relaxation at a table, if you're one of those that likes to frame your puzzles, you can frame it even and look at it. It serves a purpose, and that purpose is recognized when the puzzle is complete. Now, even though you may think that a piece is insignificant, think about how angry you would be as if today you went to a store and bought a thousand-piece puzzle and you dumped it out, and once you finished it, you realized you only got $9.99. ninety-nine. I don't cuss, but maybe I'd start then. See, each piece is small, and each piece may seem insignificant, but each piece is essential. And so as I'm looking at this piece, and I'm thinking about how a puzzle works, and just kind of picturing what happens when we put a, a puzzle together, and I started thinking about the church, and how it works the same way. Each member is essential for the work of the church to be productive, and as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, each member has been given gifts in order to build up the rest of the body. Now, as we dive into this text, I want you to think about this. What happens when a few pieces are missing to your puzzle? It's still a puzzle. It still works. You can enjoy it. You can still spend time putting the pieces together. You can still even see what the picture is. 
but it's not complete. It's clear that pieces are missing. It was not functioning the way that it was designed to function. For us, as a church, I'm talking about presence and participation. Presence meaning that we ought to be around each other often. Our Sunday morning gathering is important, but if that's the only interaction that we have with our fellow church members, we're limiting ourselves. But being present means that when the church gathers together, that we're here, that we worship together, that we see each other, that we can hear each other singing, that we can encourage one another, that we can hug each other or give an elbow bump. I've been told that I'm too hard on people when I say this, but being part of the gathered worship is not optional for the Christian. Waking up on Sunday morning and saying, man, I just want to sleep a little more. It's not an option for us. It means we've already lost the battle. As one pastor says often, and he tweets this almost every Saturday, Sunday morning church is a Saturday night decision. See, the Bible assumes that we will be part of the, the gathered assembly of believers under the authority of a local church. The Sunday morning gathering is the most important and it's the best place to start. Uh, but the other thing that I want to encourage you from this passage is not only presence, but participation. It's not enough for us just to come here and sit, listen, and leave the passage. And I hope this sermon will show you that every member is a missionary to those outside of the Christian faith, and every member has a mission for fellow members. This is what we are designed to do. This is what God has brought us together to do. It's to serve one another and 1 Corinthians has already dealt with this, is that we lay down what we want in order to be a blessing to someone else. And this is the, the whole concept that Paul is, is trying to drive home to the church in Corinth, that your rights need to step aside if you want to be a blessing to other people. And how we are a blessing to others is when we gather, when we come together, when we bake meals for one another, when we put an arm around someone who's just lost a loved one, when we are there for other people. This is why God's united us together, why he's brought us together under the banner of this local church. And so how do we exercise these? Well, this passage is clear that God has given each of us, each Christian, gifts that are designed to be used for the blessing of the congregation. And what happens when we're missing? I'm not just saying you're gone for a weekend. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you're gone. What happens when we're missing? What happens when we're unwilling to use our gifts for others? The church will continue. God's purposes are bigger than what we, what we can do ourselves. The church will survive, but it won't, won't be as effective. You've been around church long enough, probably most of you to, to have heard this, that 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. You, you've probably heard that. I have no idea if that's true or not. I'm not polling. I'm not looking at your records. I'm not doing any of that. But enough pastors have said that and enough church members have said that to make me think there may be some credence to that. I hope this morning, though, that you'll see that you, every single person, 100% of our church membership, are valuable to others in this congregation. That every single person in our church family has a role to play and a gift to give. And I want you to see that you matter, that you have a purpose, that you are valuable, that your presence and participation matter too. And whether you're doing either one of those things determines whether or not our church will continue to push forward. Let this word sink into you this morning. Let my words by, by God's grace match up to what you see in the text. And let these words from Paul be a balm for your soul. This is the main point of this passage. Really, the, the main point of this sermon is that God has given each Christian gifts to use within the body, within the local church. And the reason that he's given us these gifts is that we can be a benefit to others. Look at verses 14 through 17. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? 
For the entirety of chapter 12, Paul is using the illustration, this picture uh, of the human body to describe what happens in the church. Now, uh, the church universal, that means Christians everywhere, that means Christians here, that means Christians on the other side of the planet, but specifically, he's writing to a local assembly, a local congregation, a local church. So when I say the word church, I almost always mean the local church, the assembly of gathered believers. Now the church, to be fair, could be Christians from all time, from every part of the world. But, but I'm thinking about what we're doing now. But the truth is, Paul's letter is inspired by the Holy Spirit. God knew that this letter would be read 2,000 years after it was written. So, so it, it does, in fact, talk to us as well as individual believers in addition to being the whole congregation. Now, it makes sense because the illustration works both local and in global Christianity. First, the local church is like the human body. I, I call us a family. I don't often use the term body because if someone's not a believer and they hear me talking about the First Baptist Alcoa body, that just seems weird to people. They know what a family is, but the body whole thing, that's a little strange. But we are a body. Each person given gifts, abilities, talents, and desires in order to help the others to, to be raised up. The local church isn't a bunch of people on a roll somewhere. We are united by Christ through faith and we are joined together to make up a united family. And this is why the picture of the human body is so great to me. Paul says that the parts of the body do what they're supposed to do and they don't complain. The ear is not complaining that it's not an eye and the, the mouth is not complaining that it's not a nose. That'd be foolishness to think that something like that could happen. Each part of your body has a role to play. And each part needs to be working correctly in order for us to be healthy. And the church is the same way. Each person has at least one gift. We must be satisfied with what we have. Your gifts aren't even about you anyway. The church suffers, though, when we don't use our gifts for the benefit of others. Now listen. Jesus is not incomplete because you don't use your gifts and because I don't use my gifts. The gospel is not incomplete because we're not using our gifts. But the local church does suffer. Your gifts are given to you so that you could give them away. Remember what Paul has been saying throughout this letter. He says that unity in the local church matters. So think about how something like chapter 12 fits into that story. Unity matters, and then Paul talks about the human body. I don't think there's something a better illustration that Paul could have used than, than our own human body. The fact that everything works together. Said it last week. You don't have to think, I'm going to move my left foot now, and then my right foot, and then my left foot. You don't have to think, blink, blink, blink. Take a breath. Take a breath. Your body works that way. Your brain tells your mouth, open up. Take the breath. Your brain tells your foot, move, move, move. It's an amazing, designed human body that God has created, all pieces working together for the benefit of the others. And this is what Paul uh, talks about. Even in the face, we have dozens of muscles in our face that work together to show whether we're happy or whether we're sad. And the same concept applies to the local church. Now, I've been in churches. I've visited churches of friends uh, that, that are good, bad, not so much ugly, but, but everything in between. And, and, and there are times when I've gone into a friend's church and I'm just amazed at how everything just works. Like, there's a parking lot attendant, tells me where I need to go. I come in and I'm, 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 I'm a couple people come and talk to me. Not too many, not too little, but the perfect number. I don't know how it works. I, there, there are open seats, right? I'm not just sitting there uh, moving my thumbs around. I'm, I'm actually inter interacting with people in the church. And it just works. My kids are taken care of. They're, they're checked in well. They're, they're secure. They're safe. And the teachers love them. And, and everything just works. It doesn't take a pastor to recognize this any more than it takes someone who's not a musician to recognize musical qualities and gifts. You can see this when a church has their stuff together. There's unity around a shared cause and a shared vision. Now, preaching through 1 Corinthians feels hard because it feels like we're getting hit by a hammer. 
There's a lot of correction going on in the church in Corinth, but also for us. Uh, But I hope that you see how encouraging this passage is. Yes, there's correction, but he's saying, church, you need to know that you've been given gifts by God. You are not by yourself. No matter what you've been told, you are here for a purpose. And this is what I think the common bond for those churches that have things together And those places, and you could even say businesses that just have it going correctly, is that everybody is moving in the same direction. Everyone is united together. And Paul's trying to get this church in Corinth to do the exact same thing, to say, unite around the gospel. You're different. You come from different backgrounds. You come from different religions. You hated each other just a few years ago. Now you're uniting together under the banner of Christ and the gospel. Some of you are right now trying to figure out what you're good for. Now, I don't mean that in a trite way. There are times when many of us think that we just don't have a purpose. I've sat with people in my office, and I hear their stories, and the stories vary. Often there's abuse or neglect or lack of love or lack of affection, but they all have the same ending. The people come to the conclusion that they really have no reason to exist. I've heard this over and over and again. Listen, every person is created in the image of God, so every person has a reason to live and a purpose. We don't need to search the world to find meaning. If you're not a Christian, uh, you may think you need to do that. You may think that you need to to go travel the world and sit on mountaintops and, and talk to religious gurus to figure out why you exist, but that's not the case. You do see so much violence and anger and fighting, and you think that there has to be more than this. Let me save you a bunch of money and a bunch of travel points on your airlines. And I can tell you this, what have you found? Maybe nothing. Or maybe you've learned something that's improved your life, but eh, it doesn't really stick. It wears off. Because no matter what you find, you'll never get to the root of why you're looking for the answers in the first place. You see so much unrest in the world and you're thinking, well, what can I do to fix this? What is there? What is the meaning of life? Well, the answer is that you exist to glorify God and enjoy him forever. There's unrest because we're all sinners who've lost sight of that. That we've lost our our purpose in life. The thing that God created us to do is to worship him, glorify him, and enjoy him. And when we take our eyes off of that picture, we end up causing problems for ourselves and others. We've all come short of the glory of God and and we don't fall, uh, we don't climb close enough to God's glory to save ourselves so we're all guilty of sinning. And it's only Jesus who can fix that problem. It's only Jesus who can give any human being worth and value. See, Christians sometimes forget this too. We have our meaning. Our meaning is Jesus. Jesus. And as great as they are, the gifts do not give us meaning, the gifts do not give us purpose, but they do point us to the fact that we're created for something bigger. We're created to glorify God. But see, the church in Corinth, they were struggling with this. The more that I read this book, the more that I realize how messed up this church was. Again, we talk about going back to, we want to go back to the early church. No, in a lot of ways you don't. You want to deal with this? Yeah, we have our issues, every church does, every church has disagreements, and every church has uh, people fighting and arguing and, and not getting along, because that's what happens in your own family. But this is more than I can handle. They were struggling with understanding what Paul's saying. They had been battling over issues of spiritual gifts And then here Paul's saying, look, you all have gifts. You don't just need to go seek out these miraculous gifts. You've been given gifts by God, the creator of the universe. And he says that it's pointless and even sinful to desire the gifts that you don't have. But see, this is our default mode, isn't it? We're not satisfied. Now, that's good for for an athlete, right? If you're not satisfied with your performance on the field, you work harder. You, it pushes you to get better. It pushes you to improve. If you're not satisfied with your marriage, it pushes you to work to improve your marriage. If you're not satisfied with your performance at work, you push, you study, you train to get better at your job. It pushes you to better yourself. A lack of satisfaction 
is often a good thing. It pushes you to improve, but how quickly do those things become idols? See, idols don't start as bad. See, when we think of an idol, we often think of a little carving that we sit on a shelf, right? Or that someone sits on a shelf and, and prays and does the sounds and meditation and all that other stuff, right? The idols are found here, not there. I've thought about this, and I can't figure out one thing in my life and, and in people's lives that I know uh, of an idol that did not start out as something good. This is why they're tricky, because they always start out as something good. Think about this. If you desire your kids to be good at sports, that's great. You want them to learn teamwork. You want them to learn discipline. But what happens when, when every weekend you're gone? What happens when your whole entire week is designed around the sports schedule? What happens when you cancel on family things for sport after sport after sport, and that drives your family? It becomes an idol. What happens if you desire your kid to excel academically and that pushes you in your parenting rather than discipling them to be more and more like Jesus? Their academics become an idol. Work, family, marriage, even the church can become an idol. Those are all good things, all blessings from God, but they cannot control our affections. And see, so the church in Corinth, they were grateful for the gifts they had been given, but they weren't satisfied with what God had done. It's like a kid at Christmas. Just gave you 20 gifts. Finished rapping. I don't have any more. I've given you all of this, and you're not satisfied. You want more. They weren't satisfied with what they had. My guess is there were jealousy in the members. Just like we hear in churches sometimes that, that wait, my platform should be bigger than theirs. Why am I stuck changing diapers in the nursery? I want to be it over here. I'm not satisfied with what God has done. And Paul is telling them, stop thinking this way because it's God who has sovereignly given these gifts to the church members. And in essence, what we're saying when we're not satisfied with what God gives us, God, you made a mistake. God, I should be this or I should be doing that, not them. Oh, who's the one that put them there? Who's the one that gave them those gifts? Look at verses 18 and 19. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? The gifts that you have, the spiritual gifts, these gifts that are listed here, they didn't come from your hard work. They didn't come from your discipline. You didn't earn the right to have what you have. Instead, God gave them to you. Paul says that God arranged the members in the body. God made you exactly the way that he wanted you to be. There is nothing that falls outside of the realm of God's control, and that means that he has been the one who made you, you. He gave you all the gifts that you have. God is the one who orchestrated your past, present, and future of you and every other person in this church and every other Christian. See, some may hear this and think, well, wait. If God has control, then there's really nothing for us to do. Aside from that not being in the Bible, this thinking uh, is an attitude of a defeatist. God has promised us a future and a hope. He's achieved victory over sin. That makes us want to go do things. That makes us want to go out and share the gospel. That makes us want to go on mission. That makes us want to do all of the crazy things that Christians do because they're so enamored with the love of God and the grace of God that they can't help but do those things. See, I'm encouraged by God's sovereignty. Think about this church. Over 100 years old. Some of you have been here for decades and decades and you've seen the ups and the downs and some of you have even expressed, oh, I just don't know. I don't know how long this church is gonna last. I just, I just don't know. And I'm grateful that more of you have said God has not taken his hand off of this church. That God has preserved this church family for over 100 years and it looks like in my heart that he's gonna continue to do this for hundreds of more unless Jesus comes back, and we pray that he does. 
See, I believe his hand's still on us. Does, does FBA look different than a few decades ago? Absolutely. Does FBA look different than a few years ago? Yeah. But I don't think God's done with us. And to be honest with you, even if he is, we'll move on and God will still be on his throne. Do you see, God wins no matter what. Even when a church that, that God has united together starts to, to separate and to fray and to rip apart at the seams, God's still God. God's still in control. God's promises don't go away. But I don't believe he's finished with us yet. And I hope you believe that too. And if you do, then we need to see that God's plans uh, for us are to that we do not live independent of one another. Look at verses 20 through 27. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the, to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body. Again, hear this. God has composed the body. He has brought us together. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be, again, no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. One of my favorite verses. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Does that sound like a church that you can belong to that avoids deep relationships? Does this passage give you any idea that it's okay for a church member to avoid spending significant time with others in the church? No. This is the state of so many churches that I've encountered. People give, people come on Sunday mornings, uh, and that's the end of the religious commitment. Paul's word calls us to do so much more you may say, well, Ryan, I'm, I'm just a private person. I, I don't want people knowing about my life. Being private does not give you the right to live some way apart from the rest of the body of Christ. Well, I don't want to bother anybody with my troubles. You don't have that right either. Look at verse 26 again. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. How can we suffer or rejoice together if I don't know what you're suffering or rejoicing about? You can't do this on Sunday morning unless you're gonna be disruptive. So where does this happen? It happens every day of the week when we gather for meals, when we invite people into our homes, when we go out to lunch, when we go visit someone at their job, when we see people in the grocery store. This happens in community groups and in Bible studies. This is what happens. Now you may want to express your independence, but you can't support that from reading the Bible. Yes, we're an independent people. Yes, this is what America was founded on. Literally, we have a, a day, our most famous holiday is based on the Declaration of Independence. Like, we're excited to be independent. And, and after living in East Tennessee for two years, the Scots-Irish thing, it makes us, you, even more independent. I don't need your help. I can do it on my own. I got this figured out. You're laying under a tractor and you're trying, no, I got it, I'm I'm good. I'm good. There's a problem with this. We were not created to live independently of one another. Not in the world and not in the church. We are created to function best in community. But some may still think, well, you know, Sunday morning worship, that, that when we gather together on Sunday, well, that's my community. And I'd ask you this. Where is it that you talk about your doubts? We all have them. Where, where is God in this? Where, where do you bring that up? Where, where do you ask those difficult questions that religious people aren't supposed to ask, but we need to? Where do you talk about your struggles with sin? Where do you bring up, man, I am struggling with this particular sin right now. Where does that come up? Because if that's not coming up, then you're missing out on a, on a vital piece of what God has given to us in the local church. This is what community is. This is what, uh, where incredible growth happens. When you are open about your life, your history, and your struggles, the church can then uh, suffer with you. 
In other words, the church can be, uh, the, best be the church when it's willing, people are willing to be vulnerable and honest. See, God designed us for community. He designed us to be surrounded by one another, not just when we need help, but as a normal way of living. It's hard for some to accept, and it's probably hard for some to even hear this. The reality is, is if you've been part of a church or churches that are focused on numerical growth, this may sound like I'm speaking Greek right now. It's because in a lot of places, it's numbers that matter most. We need to do whatever we can in order to get more people to come because that's how we define our success. More people, more people giving, more people attending, more people active. And I'm all for numbers. I'm all for more people coming. I'm grateful for that. But if you want more people to come, you're not gonna expose the sin that's inside your heart, are you? If our aim was to draw people and more people, There's no way that we're all just gonna rip open our hearts and just pour out what we believe and what we're struggling with. It's gonna make people feel weird and uncomfortable, then they won't come back. For many years, we've swept stuff under the rug and and our doubts and our problems, we just hope that they go away. And then we put on the Christian Sunday facade and, and we come smiling and then the minute that we go home, all those doubts come creeping back in. That's not the Christian life. And you know what that's done? It's created an entire generation of Christians who want nothing to do with the church because they have doubts, they have dirt, and they have questions that have never been answered and never been dealt with in the church. The one place that has answers. They're seeking authenticity and vulnerability and all they've received is Christian platitudes and hypocrisy. That should not be the definition of what happens in our church. God has given us the church so that we can bring him glory and so that we can serve and literally be a crutch for our brothers and sisters, to support our brothers and sisters, to rejoice with them, to lift them up when they need lifting. Look at verses 27 through 31. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, Uh, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? This is a sermon in itself that can go in a bunch of different directions, but what I see here is that this is God's provision for us. That God has given us these things to protect us. God has given the church elders to stand guard and to say, no, these things are not gonna creep into our church. No, we're protecting the church from hearing false gospels. Be grateful for that. This is God's provision for us that he allows us to exercise these gifts to be blessings. So what is our response? Look at verse 31. But earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will show you still a more excellent way. In other words, be satisfied in what God has done for you. But at the same time, have a desire for an abundance in this. In our class this morning, we talked, talked about um, the passage in Luke that talks, Jesus says, well, ask and it'll be given to you, right? And we're like, well, can I ask for a private jet? I have. I don't have one yet. I'd like one if you have one. No, we ask for spiritual things, not so that we can collect, not so that we can gain, not that we can improve, but so that we can be a bigger and better blessing for other people. So I I said this morning, I pray for patience and I pray for for, um, strength to survive when I'm angry, not so that I can just get accolades. Hey, Ryan's such a patient guy. No, so that I can be patient with people who need it, right? Right? It's what the church is. It's what the church does. Our aim is to be a blessing to the church family, so we desire these gifts so that we can be a bigger blessing to everyone else. And so the the big question for you this morning is this. How do we know what our gifts are? And when we find out what, what our gifts are, what do we do with them? Now, you may be frustrated with me now because I haven't really told you anything. I haven't said anything. 
Haven't given you any advice, Pastor. We're, give us some practical things that we can walk out. Well, here you go. First, always in everything examine scripture. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about your gifts? Specifically, what gifts does God give? Because I've met people who say they have a gift of this or that, and I'm like, that's not in the Bible. I have the gift of being brutally honest. No, you have a gift of being a jerk. That's what it means. That's me. I'm saying that sometimes. No, that's not in the Bible. What does the Bible say? What are those gifts that are listed? What are you supposed to do with them? Second, ask others. This is something that I think we don't do very well because we're not the best at being self-aware. We tend to not see those deficiencies, and so we need others to come in and say, yeah, I know, I know, I know this is not good for you. Case in point, we got some bad news this week, and um, I came in, and, and Cody um, said to me, he said, uh, I really didn't even want to tell you this because I know how you'd respond, and I'm like, mm. yeah, it's not good. I got angry. I wanted to lash out, I, not physically, but I was angry, and I wanted, man, I, this guy, he's, he needs to be taught a lesson. Nobody, none of you, nobody in our church. And he said, I know, I know how you'd respond. I've seen you. I'm like, oh, man, that right in the heart, right? We need others to tell us what our gifts are and what our gifts are not so we don't fool ourselves into thinking that we're good at something that we're not. Finally, think about what you like to do and what you're good at. A question many professional coaches or life coaches will say is if you could do one thing in your life and you knew that you wouldn't fail, what would it be? And the answer is something that's what you need to pursue if you can. It's a good question to ask. What excites you? What motivates you? What gets you out of bed every morning? What, what causes you to be energized rather than depleted? Because I can tell you this, and we've told people this in our church, no, nah, I don't think you should be serving there because I'm not sure that's your gifting. Because what it's gonna do is you're gonna burn yourself out. Yeah, you see a need, and yeah, you wanna help. Yeah, you wanna fill this hole, but that's, mm, that's not where you should be. You will quickly burn yourself out to the point where you're of no use to anybody. Ask yourself, what is it that I love to do? What is it that I'm good at? Now, on the other end of the spectrum, I've talked to people over the years um, that think they're not good at anything, that will say that, ah, you know, I just don't have anything to offer. Yeah, I come to church, I, I'm here, I'm present, but ah, I, don't, I don't have anything to give. So what often happens is people decide to shrink back and, and not actively participate in the community, hoping that things will just pass them by. That's not a good way to live, and not only that, it's going against what we see in Scripture. And I hope you find encouragement in this passage, I really do, because I've been encouraged in this, that we all have gifts and abilities that have been given to us by God. And he desires for us to use those gifts in the life of the local church. And I hope you're challenged by this. I hope that you see areas of deficiency in your own life, places that you could and should be serving in, but you've sat back, and that's not healthy for you, it's not healthy for others. Reread this whole book and start thinking through, how is it that I can be a blessing and be a unifier in the local assembly? Serve where God has called you to serve. Paul's use of the human body, it's not an accident that he uses it. He knows that for a church to be healthy, all the members must be working together. Our bodies can live without certain parts, but it makes it harder and it guarantees difficulty. What God has given to you must be used as a blessing to others to help build up the rest of the body, to help it function, to help it thrive, to help it live and continue to move forward. My prayer this morning is that you are encouraged and challenged by the word of God to serve more, to serve better, and to use your gifts for his glory. Would you pray with me?